Welcome, Algebra 1. We are looking today in our Saxon book. So I know that uh, there are some summer lessons that my Algebra 1 class has to complete before coming back to our co-op. So today what I wanna do is just practice a few of these lessons that you are doing at home just so I can be a help and uh, maybe reinforce some of the things you've been learning before school starts. So I'm looking in lesson 10 of your Saxon third edition uh, algebra one book. So I'm looking at page 47 is where lesson 10 begins. Now uh, it's talking about divide by zero and we know that we can never divide by zero. In fact, if you type that into your calculator, your calculator shouts at you error um, because you should never divide by zero. So that is considered undefined. Now, your Saxon book shows you six divided by zero is undefined, but zero divided by six is zero. I have nothing. I have six friends that I'm trying to divide nothing, and all your six friends look at you and say, you gave us nothing, right? That's okay. Zero can be in the numerator. Zero can never be in the denominator. All right? Um, so uh, it also talks about the commutative property of multiplication. And that means that our order can change. I can have three times four. I can have four times three. It still means the same. And that's really helpful later on when we're doing algebra, that if you see a fraction that's perhaps even and the next number is odd, but the third number that you're multiplying by is even, you could switch the order of those two because of the commutative property and you can easily reduce. So I love that commutative property. Um, it, it, it simply means if I do one times two times three, that means the same thing as one times three times two. So there's your commutative property. Now uh, let's look on page 49 and it has a little bit of practice for us. So uh, the practice are always the lettered problems and that's what you'll be doing in our co-op this year, the lettered problems as well as the even. So it simply says simplify. So we're solving uh, these problems. So look at letter A, negative three minus two over negative two plus eight minus six. So we're solving these. Now I know with um, technology the way that it is that um, you could actually plug all of this into a calculator, but our minds are a better calculator than even the fanciest of calculators because our minds are gifts from our creator. And you know, have you ever plugged something in the calculator a little bit wrong and the calculator doesn't understand what you meant? So that's why your mind is even better. So let's uh, move to my board and we'll spend a few minutes working some of these practice problems. All right, so let's look at letter A. So the first thing we do, I know that I have negative three minus two. And that is, the whole thing is written as a fraction over negative two plus eight minus six. Now, one thing I wanna point out to you is this is a fraction, right? It's written as a fraction, but um, a fraction is just another way to write division. So don't let that intimidate you. So if I have negative three minus two, that means I owe three and then I'm taking away two more. Now, one thing that you can do with subtraction is subtraction means the same thing as if you change the sign of the second and follow the addition rule. So if negative three minus two meant the same thing as negative three plus a negative two. I owe three, I owe two more. How much do I owe? Well, I owe five. So um, both of them were negatives. Now, this one, I can follow the, the commutative order that I can say I owe two and I owe six. I can combine what I owe first. So if I owe two and I owe six, that means together I owe eight. Then I'm going to add eight. So if I owe eight and I have eight, ah, I have nothing. Well, friends, if I have negative five divided by zero, I know that equals undefined. Do not write zero. I have had students before say, well, if I multiply by zero, it's zero, so if I divide by zero, no. This is undefined. I can never put zero in the denominator. It's a no-no in math. 
I can have zero divided by negative five, but I cannot have zero in the denominator. Anytime you see that, immediately write undefined. That's gonna be a great assessment question. So I hope you guys will remember that. Now, um, let's uh, move on to uh, letter B is similar to letter A. So let's move on to letter C. And I'll, I'll let you do B on your own at home. So letter C, I have a negative, then a parentheses, negative four, another set of parentheses, negative one, another set of parentheses, negative four. All right, now friends, there is not a lot of processes in between. Well, we have a rule that we remember. In the absence of a sign, it means multiply. When I stick numbers or variables close together and I don't put a sign there, it simply just means multiply. So what do I do with this? Well, I can simply multiply the numbers. 4 times 1 is 4, 4 times 4 is 16. Now that was pretty easy, wasn't it? Now what I've got to do is figure out what to do with all those signs. Well, let's just count them up. I have 1 negative, 2 negatives, 3 negatives, 4 negatives. Well, I know that a negative times a negative makes a positive. A negative times a negative makes a positive. If I have an even number of negatives, they cancel out. Final answer, 16. I could write positive 16, but in the absence of a sign, it means the same thing, that it's positive, right? So that is letter C. Now, uh, letter D is similar. You're just multiplying the numbers and then counting out how many positives and negatives. Now, um, on letter D, there are two negatives. So again, it's an even number. Your final answer will be positive. That's a hint for you on letter D. Now, let's move to letter E. Let me erase this. And we'll look at letter E. Letter E says use two unit multipliers to convert 44 square miles to square feet. Now let's think about this. If I have 44 miles squared and I need to convert it to feet squared. Now your book says Square feet and feet squared and square feet mean the same thing, right? So I know that in order to take something from miles to feet, I have to think through, am I going larger to smaller, smaller to larger, right? So I've got to convert that. Well, if I write that 44 miles squared, and I'm going to write it as a fraction, I'm going to multiply it by a unit um, conversion so I can easily solve it. So what I have to do is think of what conversion factor do I know will change from miles to feet? Now, the great thing about your Saxon book is it actually does have some formulas and in the back, it actually has your references if you need them to go back. I hope um, that those are back in the resources of your mind. How many feet are in a mile? 5,000, so one mile equals 5,280 feet, right? So that's a lot of feet are in a mile. That's why it takes us a little while to walk it, right? So uh, this would be one unit multiplier. But notice that I have miles squared. This is just one mile. So I actually have to do this process twice, 5,280 feet over one mile. And that's because mile times mile makes mile squared. Feet times feet make feet squared. So mile and mile, mile and mile, right? And that leaves me my final answer in feet squared. So we've got our unit multipliers. Now Saxon does not ask us to multiply this out. I've had students before who will stick that in their calculator and give me the ginormous answer, and that's fine. But all it asked was use two unit multipliers. So that's what we did. And that's all I need to see on your paper is those conversion factors. So great job. So that's lesson number 10. And I wanted to spend some time just going over some practice. Now let's look at lesson 11, reciprocal and multiplicative inverse. Now let's talk about a reciprocal. A reciprocal just means a flip. Now I know you're thinking at home, well, if that's what they meant, why didn't they say it? Well, in math, we have to have fancy terms just like we have in, in other um, subject. So reciprocal, when you hear it, just means the inverse, the flip, right? Now, um, if it asks you 
for uh, the reciprocal of a fraction and it shows you two thirds. So I'm on page 51 of your Saxon book. You can follow along with me. If I have two thirds, the reciprocal of it, flip it. If two is in the numerator, three is in the denominator, flip it. Three over two is your new reciprocal. Now, the hard thing that students have is what about when it's not written as a fraction? How do I know what that reciprocal is? Well, let's talk. So we just said two thirds, the reciprocal of it would be three halves, right? Well, how about if I had the whole number four, what would be the reciprocal of that? Well, what you need to do is think through that four is a whole number. How do I rewrite that as a fraction? Four over one, the reciprocal would simply be one fourth. So I hope that helps as you're thinking through reciprocals. All right. Um, now, I do uh, want to point out the book talks to you about one over zero. Um, so zero is the only real number that does not have a reciprocal because you can't um, remember, we can never have something divided by zero. That's undefined. So the only number um, that we cannot find the reciprocal of is zero. Now, if a number is multiplied by its reciprocal or its multiplicative inverse, the product of the number is one. So take a look. If I multiply these two numbers, the twos cancel, the threes cancel, it equals one. The fours cancel, so it would be four over four, it is reduced to one. So anytime you multiply something by its reciprocal or another word for reciprocal, we just talked about multiplicative inverse. So uh, that's lesson 11 and that's page 51. Now we're looking at uh, page 52. It talks about order of operations. Order of operations is so important. Have you ever made something at home? You know, maybe a cake or, or just cookie, something fun. And maybe you just got out of order and the cookies didn't come out the right way or the, the cake kind of flopped in and you forgot to follow the right order. Well, that's what's so important in math. Do you know around the world, even though we speak different languages, do you know we all do the same math? Why is that? Because there has to be an order. You know, we can't say, well, here in America, we would get the answer as, but in Japan, they would get the answer as, no, you see, math is universal. It's a universally spoken language because there's an order, there's an absolute that has to be followed. So what is our order of operations? Well, let's talk about it. Um, I love this little acronym for order of operations. So order of operations is please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, all right? So I know that may sound like, what? Some people just say PEMDAS, but I say please, parentheses, exponents, or you could also call them powers, right? Exponents are powers, like it's squared, cubed, whatever. So parentheses comes first in our order of operations, exponents or powers, and then we have multiplication and division from left to right, and lastly, we have addition and subtraction from left to right. So that's why it's so important that everyone follow the same order of operations. I actually had um, even some adults recently contact me and they said, please help us. We're having a family dispute over what's the right answer for this problem. And you know what? It came down to, you bet, order of operations. So um, I hope uh, you guys understand how important that is. So let's take a look on page 53 and um, the practice that we're looking at is uh, letters A through D on page 53 for lesson 11. So it says, and let me write those down for us. So it's four, oh, excuse me, I'm looking at the um, example and I want to do the practice problem with you. Six times three minus four, parentheses, five, parentheses, six. Now you might say, well, Miss Kim, I think I'll just plow through and solve it. And I, I want to caution you because that's what our brains do. We read a book from left to right. Math doesn't always work that way. We have to follow the order of operation. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. All right, there, the parentheses are here, but there's nothing inside of them and in the absence of a sign, it just means multiply. 
So it would just be negative four times five times six. Now there are no exponents, so we're gonna immediately go from multiplication and division from left to right. So here I'm multiplying, and then all of these I'm multiplying. Now I have a habit when I'm solving a problem that I underline what I'm doing, and I always work down. That way I know I haven't forgotten anything. I don't forget to bring down a sign. I have done math a lot of years, my friends, and that's an easy way to get the wrong solution is to leave something out. Six times three, 18. Don't forget to bring down your minus sign. Four times five, 20. 20 times six, 120. All right, so then I'm going to solve that. So 18 minus 120. Well, I owe a lot more than I have. So what do I end up with? I owe 102, right? So my answer, negative 102. And you can see I subtracted last because addition and subtraction come at the end after I've multiplied. So that's my order of operations. Now, um, let's skip all the way to the last one. That was letter A. And the last one we're gonna skip to is letter D. All right? So, letter D, I have 13 minus four, parentheses, negative five minus three, parentheses, 10. All right? So, I have, uh, the parentheses are just around these, right? So there's no process, so it just means multiply. So I'm gonna put dots here so I remember. So I'm gonna multiply first. This is 13 minus, this is multiply, and this is multiply. So let's rewrite it, 13. Now I've got negative four times negative five would be plus 20. And then I've got negative three times 10 minus 30. You see, I multiply and divide first, and my last sign is then to add and subtract from left to right. I have 13, I have 20, that makes 33 minus 30, final answer, three. I love to circle our answers so that way I know where they are. So letter A and letter D on lesson 11. Now I'm going to pause for just a moment because speaking of making sure you have the right thing, I have a pumpkin coffee cake in the oven and my timer just went off while I was doing that problem. So I'm gonna push pause, then I'll come right back, my friends. But I want you at home, if you're watching this, to write the word pumpkin in your homework notebook. And I'm gonna give you some extra credit just for practicing extra math even before the school year starts. So pumpkin is our uh, keyword. Don't share it with anybody else, but write it in your notebook and I'll give you extra credit for it. I'll see you right back. Unpause. Thanks so much for being patient, huh? All right, so um, we just finished with lesson 11 and we did A and B. Now I wanna jump into lesson 12. So lesson 12 is continuing more of these order of operations. So I'm gonna leave my PEMDAS on the board so that way I don't forget. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Super important. Now, um, your book kind of talks to you a little bit about brackets. Brackets and parentheses work the same, but one thing I want to point out to you, innermost, um, we follow that first. So when you see parentheses, it can also be brackets, but you always follow and start innermost and work your way out. So, you know, parentheses are kind of uh, fun to work with. You know, um, I often tease that it's like parentheses get presidential treatment. You know, could you imagine if you were at a local fast food place? Like, let's say Chick-fil-A. Everybody loves to go Chick-fil-A and the lines are super long, right? But let's say the motorcade with our president pulled in and, and he said, you know, I want some Chick-fil-A today. Well, you know, are we gonna make him stand at the back of the line or is Secret Service gonna come right up? And, and they're gonna say, you know what? You get presidential treatment, you get to go first. Well, that's the way parentheses work. They say, hey, hey, hey. I often tell students, it's like neon flashing lights. I get to go first is how the parentheses are, right? Have you ever had that happen? Maybe um, something was going on and, and maybe it was someone's birthday and they said, let them go first. It's their birthday. They got presidential treatment that day, right? They got to go first. So that's what parentheses do in math. It's neon flashing lights saying, I get to go first, all right? So let's look at number 12. 
or excuse me, lesson 12, and there again are four practice problems, and we're going to do just a couple to make sure you understand what's going on. So let's look at practice A. I'm on page 56 of my Algebra 1 book. So letter A says negative 3 minus 2, and it has parentheses around it, then another set of parentheses, negative 4 minus 1. Remember my order of operation says parentheses get to go first. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to do negative 3 minus 2. I owe 3 minus 2 more. You can look at it on number line. If I owe 3 and I'm subtracting 2, I'm going deeper in debt. Another way to rewrite it would be negative 3 plus negative 2. So if I am taking away 2, that's the same thing as adding a negative 2. Same thing. So I'm going to say negative 5. Now I'm going to go ahead and take out that parenthesis because I solved it, negative 5, right? There is no sign in between these two parentheses, so I'm going to put a multiplication. When there is no sign, it's an understood multiply. Now, let's solve this one. I owe 4, I owe 1 more. Another way to rewrite it is to change the sign of the second, follow the addition rule. I owe 4, I owe 1, now I owe 5. So I have negative 5 times negative 5. My answer, positive 25. Anytime I'm multiplying a negative times a negative, my answer is positive. Now I know my rules are different, and don't let that confuse you. You know, when I'm adding two negatives, I'm going deeper in debt. Have you ever owed your parents some money, and then you owed some more? Did they then say, okay, now you're out of debt? No, you owe more, right? We can't have bad math. Could you imagine going to the bank and say, I've already owed you once, I've owed you twice, now you owe me. The bank is going to um, call the police and say, this man is confused in their math, right? So that's why it's important to understand math processes. When I multiply two negatives, my rules are different. And uh, you might say, well, that's not fair. And remember, math is always fair. Do you know when you were a little kid, you probably had a different bedtime than you do now. Why? Because your rules have changed, right? Because you're maturing, you're a young adult, and so your rules have changed. Well, think of multiplication and division. Their rules are different than addition and subtraction. So that's a good way in your mind to separate the two. If I'm going deeper in debt each time, I'm adding. Those negatives are, are going deeper in debt. I'm not canceling out those negatives. But when I multiply, two negatives do cancel out. So that's why it's important to remember those rules. Now let's take a look at letter... Uh, let's uh, move to letter B because it's a little bit different than letter A. It says 6 minus 2, parentheses, minus 4 minus 6. So again, I'm doing my parentheses first. 6 minus 2 is 4. Bring down your sign. What's 4 minus 6? Well, I have 4 positive, but I'm taking away 6. I don't have that many. So I'm going to end up with negative 2, right? I owe more than I have. So now it's 4 minus negative 2. Well, if I'm not not going to the store, I am, right? So if I would say I'm taking away the negative, then that would cancel those two out and make it positive. My final answer is 6. Don't let that confuse you. If it's 4 minus negative 2, I'm not not going to the store, therefore I am. Another way you can see it is I'm taking away this negative, change the sign of the second, follow the addition rule. It is 6, my final answer for letter B. All right, I would encourage you, if you're struggling a little bit with your signs, take some time this week to go to Khan Academy or Virtual Homeschool and review those. It is so crucial for upper level math that you understand your rules for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with your signs. I've seen a lot of students struggle in algebra, and it's not because they couldn't do the math. They struggled with these basic principles of um, integer and, and how, to, how to solve positives and negatives. So I would really encourage you to take a few minutes and uh, really, really boost that understanding. So make sure you practice with those. All right, let's uh, do the last one in this section. So again, we're on lesson 12, and let's look at letter D. D as in dog. All right, so letter D says negative 3. Speaking of dog, there's mine. Uh, occasionally in my videos, you'll hear Sadie. Sadie is a miniature schnauzer, and so she has a uh, very loud hello. So um, it's funny that I just said dog, and we hadn't heard her at all until that moment. So she just wanted us to know she's there, right? 
All right, so that was a big problem for letter D and I've copied it. So I hope you take time at home to copy that as well. Now remember, even when you watch these videos, you need to write this in your notebook because to receive full credit, I have to see your work. So no work equals no credit. So that's a, a good math way to remember it. All right, so let's remember our rules. Parentheses come first. So let's find those parentheses. Here's 10 minus eight. So I'm gonna rewrite it. Negative three times two, because I have 10, I'm taking away eight. And then I've got minus a negative four. So what would that be? That would be plus four over four, and then I've got parentheses here, so there's no sign that's understood multiply. A negative three times a negative three makes positive nine minus 13. So you see what I've done is I've rewritten it and brought it down. I'm gonna move over here, but on your paper at home, just keep bringing it down. So now I'm gonna uh, follow order of operations, which all I have left to do is multiply here, then everything else is add or subtract. So negative three times two is negative six, plus four. So negative six plus four will give me, I owe two, right? I have more that I owe than I have. So uh, I solve this, negative three times two is negative six plus four is negative two. Now I just add and subtract from left to right. Four plus nine is 13. 13 minus 13, uh-oh friends, do you see a problem? <gasps> Did you catch it? Did sirens go off in your mind? I can't divide by zero. I hope so. So we're not gonna write zero, are we friends? We're gonna write undefined, all right? So we know it is undefined and not zero. I hope you caught that at home. All right, lesson 13 talks uh, more about order of operations and uh, more about solving that. Do you see how many lessons that Saxon has focused in on order of operations? And that's because our order, how we solve things is crucial to the success of algebra. So that's why uh, they spend so much time on it. So I hope that you will make sure you take time on that as well. Now let's uh, look at the end of chapter 13. The end of chapter 13 has uh, some practice problems. I'm on page 61. So uh, take some time to look over those. They talk to you about um, the number two and then the opposite of it. If I look on a number line, here's zero, here's one, and here's two, so the opposite of the number is, if this is two spaces away, if I have the number two, the opposite would be two spaces away from zero, the opposite way. So the opposite of two is negative two. The opposite of negative two is two. So make sure uh, that you uh, understand what Saxon is teaching when it explains the opposite. All right, now let's look at our practice problems. Now there are um, five of them on page 61. So it is quite intensive if we look at letter um, A. So let, let's start there. It's a long problem, isn't it? So it has three and then it has, I'm not, I'm not as good at drawing those, all right? Our brackets, right? It's a fancy bracket, isn't it? Uh, two and then a bracket, um, then a parentheses. Wow, we've got a lot, don't we? Negative four minus three. Don't let it overwhelm you. Remember that it's innermost first. Negative eight minus two, end of parentheses, minus four, end of brackets, and then um, our last set of parentheses, right? So innermost first, negative four minus three. I owe four, I'm owing three more. I can also look at it as I'm saying plus a negative three. Same thing. So I owe seven. So there is no sign here. So it's an understood multiply. I owe eight. I owe two more. Or I can say plus a negative two. So I owe 10, right? So I'm, I'm looking at these and I'm solving it. So if I bring this down three, I'm going to change this to a bracket and then two and then I'm gonna put parentheses because I'm solving these set of parentheses. So I've got negative seven times negative 10 minus four, parentheses bracket, right? So I've solved the inner parentheses first, and then I, I'm just bringing, I'm, I'm taking each step innermost first, working my way out, and I'm just slowly solving, right? So negative seven 
uh, times 10. How do I know it's multiplied? Because there is no sign between the parentheses. That's an understood multiply. So negative 7 times negative 10 would be positive 70 minus 4. I'm going to underline that so I remember that's what I solved there. Right? And here I was solving that. All right. So I have 70. I'm taking away 4. So that leaves me with 66. Right? Uh, don't forget, I forgot to bring down. Oh, no, I did bring down mine. Do you see that, friends? I almost added an extra problem. Do you see? I forgot that I brought down the 4 and I was getting ready to add it again. So 70 minus 4, I know is correct, 66. So I have 66. Now I'm going to 66 times 2, and then the whole thing is going to be multiplied by 3. So 66 times 2 is 2 times 6 is 12. Carry my 1, that should be a 13. Did you catch that at home? I hope so. So 66 times 2 is 132 times 3. So I'm going to multiply that out. 3 times 2 is 6. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times 1 is 3. So my final answer, 369. Watch your signs because a negative times a negative made a positive, but then I subtracted 4. So I ended up with positives. So make sure you're on the lookout for that. And uh, that was practice letter A. Now let's move all the way to practice C. I have negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 3 times negative 3. Woo, that's a lot of integers. Well, don't let it overwhelm you. A negative 2 times a negative 2 is simply positive 4. Now, um, negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So I simply end up with positive 36 because there were four negatives. So letter C was actually looked intimidating, but it was pretty easy. Letter D, I have a lot of parentheses and brackets, but all that it is is number two. Now, uh, your book uh, shows you that you can think of it as the opposite and the opposite. I would encourage you just count up the number of negatives. If it's even, then your final answer is positive. If it's odd, your final answer is negative. So let's count them up. One, two, three, four. I have an even number of negatives. Therefore, my final answer for letter D is positive two. So that's it. All right. Um, letter E, it says, is the following product a positive number or a negative? Do not multiply. Just give your reason. So look at letter E. It is huge on uh, in our textbook on page 61. Well, it just wants to know, is it positive or negative? Let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven negatives. Seven is an odd number. Therefore, six of them canceled each other out, but that one odd one made the whole answer negative. So uh, letter E, my answer is negative. All right, lesson 14. Lesson 14 is all about algebraic expressions. So what is an algebraic expression? Well, an algebraic expression is something that has an equal sign. So uh, if I had, uh, excuse me, uh, it does not have an equal sign. An equation has an equal sign. I'm glad I caught myself. That would be tough. So if I said x, x plus 2, that's an expression. It's a variable and a number. That's an expression. So what's the difference in an expression and an equation? I hope you caught it because I almost said it backwards, didn't I? X plus 2 equals 5. So this is an equation. How do I know? Well, it has the word equal. There's an equal sign. Do you hear that? So an equation has an equal sign. An expression does not. So your book is showing you different expressions. So in an expression, you can do your um, processes, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But there is no equal sign in an expression, only an equation. So let's look at the practice. On page 65, it shows you some expressions, and then it gives you the value of the variables. All you're responsible to do is plug them in. So let's look at uh, page 65. Page 65 says x minus xy, and then it tells you x, equals negative 2 and y equals 3. So friends, all you have to do is plug in the, um, the actual number for the variables. So if x is negative 2 minus 
and then I'm multiplying X and Y together, I'm gonna put parentheses, negative two times three. So remember our order of operations, we're gonna multiply first, negative two times three is negative six, but I've got this minus sign I've got to bring down. So it's negative two minus negative six. Do you see how much easier my problem is to solve when I'm writing it down and bringing things down? Because I can easily miss a sign if I'm not bringing my steps down. So I'm saying I'm not not going to the store. So what am I doing? I am. It's, this would be the same thing as saying negative one times negative six. It's positive six. So I owe two, I have six. Final answer, four. So that was letter A. Now you're simply doing the rest of those um, on your practice and I'm gonna keep moving because um, lesson 14 is your next to last lesson and all you're doing is plugging in the variable that they give you. Letter D has a lot, um, it only has two variables but it has a lot of processes. Watch your sign, you're multiplying, you're adding, you're subtracting there. All right, the last lesson that you're responsible to do before we come back, we'll also review when we uh, start co-op this year, is about surface area. So what is surface area? Surface area is um, super important because we're just talking about something that's in a 3D shape. So a lot of times it can be, um, it, if I'm looking for, um, let's say, um, that I'm wrapping a present, right? We all love to get a gift. So if I'm trying to wrap a box, I've gotta make sure. Have you ever seen somebody not have enough uh, paper and they wrap it and there's a big spot in the back? Sometimes when my kids were younger, I would just kind of put something on there. Uh, when they got smart enough to figure out, mom, you didn't have enough, they actually said, mom, you don't have enough surface area. No, they didn't really. <laughs> all right, I'm just teasing. Uh, but I do love math. So it's important to make sure, do I have enough to cover it? So surface area would be if I'm looking at something, I've, I've got a pencil box here. So if I'm looking at the surface area, I'm looking at the top, the bottom, and then all four sides, right? This is would be the shape of a rectangular prism. Um, I've got a rectangle base and a rectangle top. So um, your book actually talks to you about how to find that is you find the surface area of all top, bottom, and sides. Now, I would encourage you, if that works for you, that's great. I'm a formula girl. I love to find a good formula and then follow it. That's why I love recipes. That's why I love cooking. So, um, if you uh, would prefer to follow the formula, then I'll be glad to, to talk to you about the formulas of those and uh, show you some different ways to solve those. So, uh, your book says, find the surface area of a rectangular prism dimensions are in inches. And that's super important because, you know, if I walked into Lowe's and I said, hey, um, I need five, they're gonna look at me like I'm crazy. Um, and, and I pointed at some something, maybe, um, maybe I was looking at lumber, I need five. Well, do you need five yards? Do you need five feet? Do you need five inches? You know, are you building a house? You're building a dollhouse, right? So my measurements are super important. So that's why um, at any time we do a dimension problem, you always have to have your label. So I'll write you a note and put labels. Um, and so you'll know uh, that's super important for me is you always have to include your label. Well, let's look at practice A, all right? So practice A, we're on page 70. This is lesson 15, woo woo. If you made it this far, you're right on the tail end. Now don't forget, you need to uh, fill in uh, the rest of the practice problems I haven't done, and then you'll also do all the even, two through 30. So, um, surface area for letter A. I'm looking at a rectangular prism. So here's my rectangle, and uh, I'm looking at this shape, right? So it's a rectangular prism. Uh, this is one of the few things I can draw. Most of the time I cannot draw well, right? So uh, they tell me that, that uh, three, two, and four. Four is my long, and then they tell me that two is the side, I'll put that there, and then three is here, right? So your book actually teaches you to find, oh, excuse me, your book teaches you just find the area of each one. Well, if I know this is three and this is four, the top is just gonna be three times four, right? So three times four would equal 12. Now that's here and that's also here. Since this is three, this is also three. So your book is showing you to find the top and the bottom, 
3 times 4 equals 12, right? So you could do that twice. Now, the sides, this would be 2 times 3 is 6. That's this side and then this side. 2 times 3 is 6, right? And then you've got to find the front and the back. So what would that be? 4 times 2 is 8. 4 times 2 is 8 because the front and the back are both the same. So then your book shows you just add all those up. Well, I know 12 and 8 make 20. This makes 20, so that's 40, 40, and 52. So it's 52, and our book told us our label. Don't stop there. I'll cry. So it said dimensions are in inches. So it's inches squared. Anytime you're finding area, your units are always squared because we did 3 inches times 4 inches. That's 12 inches squared. So each of these labels were inches squared, then we added them up and got 52. Now, if your brain works that way, you're welcome to do it. The negative is, I find that sometimes students can get mixed up in which one uh, those are. So I remember I told you I'm a formula girl. So I loved the formula for surface area. So what does that look like and how can I solve it? Well, the formula to find surface area is simply two capital B plus pH. All right, so what does capital B mean? Capital B means the area of the base. So surface area is two times the area of the base. Well, I know the base is four and the side is three, so I'm going to write four times three is my base, right? Then I find the perimeter of the base. Well, we said that four and three or the base, so perimeter is just adding up the sides. Remember the perimeter of a rectangle is 2L plus 2W, right? So uh, because I've got four and four and three and three. So what would that perimeter be? Well, you can add it up, four and four is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's 14 times, what's the height? Two, right? So uh, that's how I find surface area using a formula. So 2 times 12 is 24 plus 14 times 2 is 28. Let's add it together. So 8 and 4 is 12, carrier 1, 52 inches squared. Now, which one do you prefer? That's up to you. Everybody's mind works a little bit differently, but the beautiful thing is it all comes out correct. So I don't mind which way you solve it. You can do it the Saxon way and break it down, or you can know your formula for surface area. So surface area, this is the formula as long as it's a prism. That means the, the top and the bottom are the same shape. It's a different formula for surface area if you have a pyramid or um, a cone, something where the top and the bottom aren't the same. So uh, but this uh, surface area formula will always work as long as it's a prism. Top and bottom are the same. So I hope this has been a help to you. I can't wait to see you in co-op. And uh, remember that all of your work must be attempted. Please make sure that you show your work clearly and neatly label your lessons. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you uh, back in co-op and we'll jump right into our Saxon algebra. God bless you all.